So it is a complete honor today to be introducing Philip Hennig. So Philip is a professor at the University of Tübingen, also affiliated with the Max Planck Institute for um, Intelligent Systems. Um, I know Philip from when he hosted me when I was a PhD student in 2012, and I consider him a mentor of mine. And when I write papers, I try to match Philip's standards of clarity, rigor, and depth. And I think compared to the many of the machine learning papers coming up today, Philip's papers are the ones that are likely to be still discussed like a thousand years from now. Um, and <laughs> like Philip and his collaborators are in the process of, of, of basically inventing a new field or a new foundation for the entire field of numerics. So all of the basic optimization and integration algorithms that we use today. So it's very exciting. Without further ado, here is Philip Hennig. Thank you very much, David. Um, and thank you very much for this very kind introduction. This is, this is going to be impossible to live up to, so, um, but I'll try my very best. Um, and thanks to the Fields Institute for inviting me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be part of this um, a, a very prestigious uh, a, a set of presentations. I had a look at the people who uh, pre presented before me on YouTube. It's very impressive. So what I'd like to convince you of today, if there is any need for uh, convincing left, is that there's a lot left to do to improve the efficiency and basically even the, the quality of computations that we do in machine learning. So what do I mean by that? Um, you may, if I say computations in machine learning, you may think of advanced uh, notions of computation like quantum computing. I'll leave that to um, much more intelligent people. Instead, I'll focus on the things that we already do today and um, see if we can improve those. So for me, let me just see if I can get focus on the right window. Um, so for me, the computations of machine learning are numerical computations. And by numerical, I mean computations of quantities that don't have a closed form expression. This is a, maybe a, a difference between contemporary machine learning and classical rule-based AI, where the computations were typically on discrete set of problems. In contemporary machine learning, we're typically optimizing, integrating, simulating continuous systems. So we're solving integrals to do Bayesian inference. We're solving optimization problems to um, find empirical risk minimizers, point estimates, we're solving differential equations to simulate whenever an agent interacts with a data source. And we use linear algebra to do all of the above, basically, because it's the base case of everything, to solve Gaussian integrals, to optimize quadratic functions, and to simulate from linear differential equations. So all of these problems are not new. They have been studied in applied mathematics for definitely decades, maybe even centuries. And there are many algorithms out there to address all of the problems I just listed. And some of them are even here in, on, on this slide. But of course, it's a super, super incomplete list. But I do think that the contemporary setting of, let's call it data-centric computing, or computational statistics, or machine learning, or AI, or whichever moniker you want to use, does pose some new challenges for these kind of problems. And this is Primarily, I've tried to come up with a, like a, form, like a, a, a reduced set of why this is. And I think it's for three different reasons, at least. The first one is maybe the most banal and boring one. And that's the, that's the fact that our models are extremely high dimensional. Um, in, and by extremely high dimensional, I mean not just that there's lots and lots of numbers. And by now, we've all, like, I think, gone accustomed to just seeing out, outlandish numbers of parameters in a deep model, but that this number of parameters is often chosen to match basically the cache size or the memory size of the machine, which means something. It means that it's impossible to store several copies of these parameter sets. So for example, one thing we can't do is we, can, can, we can't keep a trace of the last 200 gradients or so that we computed in deep learning, to, for example, to estimate the Hessian like you would have done in a classic quasi-Newton method. But maybe this is not so prominent a problem because there are also classic algorithms for extremely high dimensional problems. What is a very fundamental challenge is the fact that computation in machine learning these days is fundamentally stochastic. And you see the prototype of this situation um, down here on this slide. I'll maybe if there's a little bit of time at the end of the talk, talk more about this. Basically, whenever we try to now do some form of differentiable programming, machine learning, then we tend to compute some quantities that um, are often something like an unregularized likelihood or an empirical risk, a sum over a bunch of terms, where each term depends on one datum and all of the parameter values. 
And then invariably, when we want to compute with these quantities, we subsample, we compute mini batches and draw basically random variables that are estimators of the quantity we actually want to compute. So as I said, I want to put this aside for a moment and maybe there's time in the final 15 minutes or so of the talk for me to address this issue. Because the third issue that I want to, uh, want to address first in the talk is the fact that if you're doing data-centric computation, if, you're, if you accept the fact that we're building computer models that learn from data, then we now typically face several different sources of information. Mechanistic sources of information, empirical sources of information, so data and prior knowledge, and also um, computing as a source of computation, uh, of, uh, of information. And the classic view on numerical computation doesn't put this idea front and center. It is, of course, used for these kind of settings, but it's, it's more of an afterthought. And I'll tell you in a moment what I mean by this precisely. And so what this all means for me is that, and this is sort of sneak preview, the entire idea behind the research of at least my, myself and my group and a few other people as well, is that we as machine learners have to rethink about the numerical methods we want to use and how we want to build them. And the wonderful insight that one can then arrive at is that w although it's great to do this kind of research in co collaboration with applied mathematicians and, and uh, other people from scientific computing, it turns out that we in machine learning and computation, in, uh, in computer science, maybe even have a little bit of a license to think about these numerical methods. Why? Because they actually are learning machines. So a numerical method is a quantity that estimates an, as I said, intractable quantity, an integral, the solution of a large scale linear equation and so on from tractable quantities, from evaluations of the integrand, from matrix vector products and so on. And that means we can think of these, these algorithms as agents that estimate an unknown quantity given data. It's just that the source of the data for numerical algorithms isn't the physical world. The data is not stored on hard drive. The data is produced by the CPU or the GPU or whatever compute hardware you use. But that's the only difference, really. And as we all know, you can quantify uncertainty from data, no matter where the data comes from, whether the floating point numbers come out of the, the computing unit or of a uh, data storage isn't really of concern. And that means we can build new numerical algorithms, which we call probabilistic numerical algorithms, which are basically learning machines, which are phrased in the language of machine learning, phrased in um, the sense of writing down a prior distribution over an unknown quantity, writing down a likelihood that relates the result of computations to the unknown quantity, multiplying the two together, applying Bayes' theorem, and getting a posterior over the unknown quantity. So what do I mean by that? That sounds like a, like a relatively abstract idea and maybe something that's a bit over the top as well. So I'd like to now move to a concrete example and show you why I think it's necessary to build such models and why I think they hold a lot of promise beyond even just being uncertain about computation. And for that, I want to pick a concrete, relatively simple, but concrete problem that um, is probably still on everyone's mind, even though it now probably fades from view as we are trying to push it out of our common memory, maybe. So here's a data set that shows the um, counts of corona infections in uh, Germany in 2020 and 2021. So that's the early, the first three waves out of, by now I've lost count, four or five or however, however many we had. And I've, you probably all remember how we kept staring at, these, at this kind of data set, as this, at this kind of timeline um, over the past few years, in particular in phases when those counts were rising. And the typical challenge back then, so, so this is a very simple data set, right? It's a one-dimensional time series. It's much, much simpler than the kind of data sets that machine learning is often applied to. But it's nevertheless actually a quite challenging data set for the following reason. So the, the natural question you want to address is, how does this line continue on the right? Can we extrapolate into the future? That's what everyone wanted to know about um, in you know, late 2020. But how do you do that? So if you are an, uh, um, <clears throat> if, it, if, I, if, you, if I'm allowed to, to draw the straw man of a naive undergraduate in machine learning, then the, that person would probably would, might say something like, oh, I have all these great, wonderful regression algorithms that I've learned about, deep neural networks, Gaussian processes, and so on. 
I can apply any of these to this regression problem. It's a, it's a supervised machine learning problem. But you'll probably all agree with me that if you do this, if you try to apply a standard Gaussian process toolbox or a VLU neural network or something like this to this time series, it would extrapolate very badly. Maybe it'll extrapolate linearly to the right or exponentially, or it'll return to zero or something else silly that is not really informative about what's going to happen. So this is not a regression problem. It's a structured problem for which we have underlying mechanistic knowledge. And we can represent that mechanistic knowledge, for example, through an ordinary differential equation. So one of the, problem, the, the types of differential equations that you've probably all seen before, also very simple models, are these SIR something else, SEIR or SIRD or SIRVD, whatever types of compartmental models where the population is separated into a group of susceptible, infected, recovered, and maybe vaccinated and diseased people. And there is a rule that tells us how people move from one group to the next. You get, if you are susceptible, you get, you get infected with a certain probability, then you move to infected and you, then you recover or you die and so on. This is a differential equation. And if we think about this problem as a differential equation problem, as a simulation problem, then we can solve it with a simulation method, with a solver for a differential equation. And there are myriad of them out there. But there's a problem, there's actually two problems. The first problem is that in this description I just made of a differential equation, I completely forgot about the data. Now we don't know anymore what kind of role the data is supposed to play. And there's a corresponding problem on the other side, which is that this, this differential equation contains a quantity, actually it contains several of them, but let's focus on one of them, beta, which is called the contact rate. So that tells us how often people interact with each other in the population, which evidently changed over time, over the course of the pandemic, otherwise this curve wouldn't look this way and which we don't know. There is no direct way to measure how often people interact with each other, at least not without a lot of effort. So in a sense, this is maybe an inverse problem, if you want to use a term from applied mathematics. Yes, people disagree a little bit on what inverse actually means. Sometimes it might mean that we want to infer the cause from the effect. Sometimes it might mean that there's an operator of which we want to know the inverse. But actually, maybe both of these views kind of apply here, but they are also a little bit awkward because this equation here contains a bunch of quantities, s and i and um, beta and various other ones, and we actually care about i. We want to know i of t into the future. That's the quantity we really care about. We just need beta to do so, and that's a little bit awkward. So it's not really a backward or inverse problem. It's more of a simultaneous inference and simulation task. So how are these problems classically solved? So there are, of course, many algorithms to, to address these. And for example, David has contributed some <laughs> to, something to how, how to do this. Let me first start with a very simple um, approach to this. So maybe just to formalize this a little bit, because I'm at the Fields Institute, I have to write a little bit of equ equations on the, on the slides. Um, what we have here is a differential equation. With, so in this case, an ordinary differential equation. There is a curve x, in this case, infected people, and, and s and i, and so on for which we know a relationship between the quantity and its derivatives through time. And we can observe that this curve at various points. And oh, there's an annoying line break here with some error. And we might need um, some prior assumptions about what's going on, but maybe we'll even get away without them. So what people then often do if you're faced with such a problem is that, oh, and sorry, I, I missed, of course, the most important part. There is a missing latent force, which I now called u. That's the standard, maybe often used notation, but in the previous slide, it was called beta. So what people now often do in such situations is that you start with an initial guess of the latent force. Notice that the latent force is a non-parametric object. It changes through time. It's not just some number, it's a curve. And you could start with this initial guess and then use that guess to solve the differential equation forward through time. See how well the solution, the simulated curve fits the data, compute a gradient and update you. So this is, for example, done in many, several different uh, sort of uh, pro probabilistic programming languages. I want to show you a few examples. Here is uh, NumPyro, a probabilistic programming language that um, I think came out of Uber and some people around that, open source. Um, it's, a, it's a variant of Pyro, a more modern version. Here's an example of, from, from their tutorial on um, a different kind of ODE, the Lotka Volterra Predator Prey Model. So this is what the data looks like, these circles and squares are the data, and you want to fit these curves, these blue and gray curves. Here is code for how to do this. So they define the differential equation. That's this part. That's an ordinary differential equation, a different one, but also a very simple one. And then they write down a model which says, let's create the unknown quantities. 
then solve the differential equation forward. And for that, we call one of these wonderful solvers called ODE integrator. And then we run basically a sampling algorithm that recursively, repeatedly calls this, um, this ODE int curve. Here's another example of this in, if you like, a different, uh, different programming language in, um, in Turing. That's a Julia-based uh, probabilistic programming language that where basically it's the same problem. So you again see Lotka Volterra, same different equation. And here is the, the problem being solved. So they call again an ODE solver. In this case, it's a different ODE solver. It's called SIT5. And then solve this with, well, essentially a map. This is, this is a map reduction, but it's essentially a for loop, right? That repeatedly calls the, the, the ODE solver. And of course, David has worked on, um, together with maybe other people here in this call, I'm not sure, on um, building an even a more advanced version of this where the latent quantity to be estimated is actually modeled by a deep neural network called a neural ordinary differential equation. And actually I have just for to make to make to be sure here a torch diff egg, which um, comes like is primarily authored by Vicky Chen, also out of David's group, that models such a non-parametric object, or actually it's parametric, but it's modeled by a deep neural network to um, fit the solution of an ODE to a vector, or fit, fit a vector field, sorry, such that the solution of the corresponding ODE fits to the data. But what I want to point out in all of these settings, every single one of them, is that actually, where's the best, best example to show this, let me go back to, to NumPyro, is that there is this call to this magical thing here in the middle called an ODE solver. So what is that thing here? actually what is being called here. So I checked, you can look at the code of course and see what is being loaded here. So where does ODE in come from? Oh, it comes from JAX. Okay, wonderful contemporary probabilistic, uh, sorry, not probabilistic, machine learning, differential programming uh, toolbox um, out of Google. So here is the code for the, this, this uh, ominous ODE integrator. It turns out to be a classic kind of, of um, differential equation solver. The so-called, for those people who know about this, the dominant prince pair of Runge-Kutta five and four, order five and four methods. So what, and this is the point I want to draw your attention to, what actually happens here is that when we call this object called ODE int, then let me see if I can find it really quickly in this code. I should probably zoom out a little bit. There is actually another for loop being called. Where's the best place to look at that? There's probably some map being defined somewhere here. Um, uh -huh. Meh. It'll be a call to scan, the while loop, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Line, line say, say again, which line? Uh, 205. Two oh no, sorry, uh, 215, uh, lax.scan. Ah, there we go. Okay, so, okay. Uh, thanks a lot, save me. So. The, what's actually happening here is there's another for loop inside of this call. So the outer piece of code that the user sees, the, the, the seemingly very simple one, which uh, like, uh, you know, it's kind of can be presented in a tutorial, hides the fact that there's another for loop being called. And all of you know, let me now go back to my, uh, my slide, that a double nested for loop is not necessarily a good thing. So let's see if we can do something about this. If we think about the fact, if we, if we come back to this idea that I just sort of used with grand words at the beginning, that computation is essentially an instance of machine learning. So the outer loop is certainly machine learning. We're infer inferring something. What about the inner loop? So here is how we think about an ODE solver in the probabilistic numerics kind of view, at least in the one in my group. People disagree a little bit on how to do this precisely on the numerical level. Here is an, a differential equation again, yet another differential equation to make it as simple as possible. Um, we can think about the solution of an ordinary differential equation or an initial value problem as trying to infer a curve. A curve X for which we have several kinds of information. We know that the curve satisfies this relationship, that its derivative relates to the value of some vector field, a vector field here being shown at these, as these black uh, arrows in the background. At, various lo at all locations, actually. And we know that the curve goes to some, some initial value. So in this case, this initial value is this little black dot here. We want to know this black curve, but we don't know it yet. So now what we can do is we can use this black dot, this initial value, and use it to condition a stochastic process, a prior for the deterministic quantity, on the fact that the curve has to go through this point. And because I'm a Bayesian machine and I like Gaussian processes, so I'm going to pick a particular Gaussian process, a very simple one, a Gauss-Markov process. 
If I condition this process on the fact that the curve has to go through this point, then I can evaluate the vector field at that point, because I know that the curve goes through it, and that gives me an observation of the gradient of, the vect of, of, this, vector field, of this curve. That allows me to, pre to refine the prior to an intermediate posterior, predict forward in time a little bit, and then at that new point in time, condition again on the fact that this relationship holds. So this is what we call, thanks to the work of Philip Tornarp, an information operator. We don't actually collect an observation of the gradient. To be very precise, we condition on the fact that the difference between the derivative of the curve and the value of f at x is zero. So if we do that, then we get an updated estimate and we can recursively or iteratively keep stepping forward in time to um, alternate between predicting into the future to construct an observation and then conditioning on the fact that the ODE has to hold at that time, at that point in time. If we keep doing that to the end, then we get a Gaussian process posterior or a Gauss-Markov posterior um, for the solution of the ODE. If you do this with only five such steps, then the estimate, of course, is pretty bad and the uncertainty around it is pretty high. But we can show that actually this process I just described to you is conceptually very close to that of classic ODE solvers. Very close in which sense? Well, in a few senses. So first of all, it's as expensive as the classic numerical methods. So it's also a for loop. It's because it's a Gauss-Markov process, you can implement this as a Kalman filter. So the cost is linear in the number of steps that the solver takes, just like the cost of a Runge-Kutta method is linear in the number of steps that it takes. Secondly, these algorithms have the same high convergence order as the classic method. So that means if we increase the number of steps that we allow the solver to take, then as the number of steps increases, the error, the difference between the red and the black line in this plot, drops as a, at a polynomial rate. So it drops like n, the number, n is the number of steps we take, to some power q, where q is the order of the solver. And for these um, so-called ODE filters, we now routinely run them at order 8 or 9 or 10 or even 11. That's higher than your typical classic ODE solvers, but there are classic ODE solvers that have the same rates. But then there's a new thing that doesn't really play a role in the classical numerical methods because they don't care so much concretely about uncertainty, which is the contraction rate of this posterior. So as the red line contracts to the black line, we also want the surrounding Gaussian process to contract at a rate that well, is related to this error. And it turns out that we can show that this contraction rate is actually a worst case bound so, um, to, the, to the empirical error. So the, the rate at which the black line contracts to the red line is upper bounded by the rate at which the region of uncertainty contracts around um, the red line. So it's actually a meaningful uncertainty estimate. So these algorithms for a long time were um, actually, so how are they implemented? Let me just point out that out as well. Um, so they are Kalman filters. So they, they may look really complicated on this kind of picture, it's a smooth animation, but actually what happens here is that we're, we're building essentially a Markov chain of states where the, these latent X's here are the, the states that describe the curve. They're typically not just the value of the curve itself, but also its higher order derivatives, first, second, third, and so on, all the way to Q plus one, typically. And um, we write down a prior model that describes the, 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 the development of these latent states with a stochastic differential equation. So we're modeling the behavior of a deterministic um, uh, differential equation or a deterministic system with a stochastic but linear differential equation, just like you can model the behavior of a nonlinear deterministic function with a stochastic process called a Gaussian process, right? So just like a Gaussian process is a prior for an unknown quantity, an unknown deterministic quantity, here the stochastic differential equation is the prior for a deterministic quantity. And then we condition on these observation operators, which I've mentioned before. So there is some, we construct some, some um, abstract quantity set, which in, contain the information that at various points in time, the difference between the derivative and the vector field is nil. And you can implement this as um, a Kalman filter. So most of you will have seen a Kalman filter before in some undergraduate lectures. The most important point is that this is a for loop that wraps around steps like this where this is the individual operation, it's a local internal uh, linear time step, and then you just do this over and over and over again, stepping forward through the Markov chain. Once you're at the end of the chain, you do a backward pass, a message passing along this graph, 
um, which is called the smoother, and it doesn't require evaluating the, the um, information operators again, so it's quote unquote for free. So these algorithms for a long time used to be um, more abstract kind of notions that we, we tended to write papers about and point out. Um, by now, they're actually implementations of these methods. So if you want to try them out, I very much encourage you to do so. You can check out um, problem.org, which is a software package written largely by people in my group, but also by contributors from outside. We're very much inviting um, open source um, colleagues to contribute code. Um, if you want to play around with these uh, ODE solvers, then I encourage you to try out some of the tutorials, and I'll probably not find it now right, right away, but um, oh no, here we go. Pick out any one of those, maybe the like, very simple one to get started to see how, the, how to use these algorithms. It's now actually become possible to just call them and use them like you would a classic ODE solver. Um, they're also available in uh, defect.jl. If you're the kind of person who wants to use Julia, then hopefully you have the right page open then you can find at the very bottom of them somewhere a, ah, that's the wrong page. Damn, okay, let me see if I can find it. I can pick the very much at the bottom. No, uh, of all the, there's a list of all the ODE solvers and I probably won't find the, the website now. Okay, I'll, ah, doesn't matter. You'll find it somewhere on there. Pro, um, uh, a um, pn diffact.jl, no, propdum diffact.jl by Nathanael Bosch, who has implemented these methods in um, Julia as well. Okay, so that means that these algorithms now exist. Now, how, how do we use them to solve these kind of mixed information sources that I pointed out to you earlier before? Um, so just to remind you, there's this differential equation here. We also have some data about the, cur about the, the trajectory that this system took. And we have some unknown quantity beta, the latent force, the contact rate through time, which we'd like to estimate. And the classical solution would be to start with an estimate for beta, then run a simulator that gives us a curve, that curve won't fit that black line, and now twist beta, computing a gradient, um, until the, the simulated curve fits the, the dots, basically. But I said at the beginning that beta is a quantity we don't actually know just as much as S and I are quantities that we don't know. So why treat it differently and infer it in an outer loop rather than inside of the solver? That's exactly what we can do with these probabilistic solvers. So we just are just going to extend the state space. Here's the picture that I showed you before. This is this Markov chain containing the states that describe the path of the differential equation, the, the dynamical system, and extend that state space first by additional observations. So I'm going to say, well, I also know not just that this system is described by the behavior mechanistically of this differential equation, but also I have observed that this curve goes through these points in time. And of course I can condition this because it's a Kalman filter, right? And Kalman filters can be trivially conditioned on observations of the curve um, under various observation operators. Now, if I had these two sources of information together, they would be sort of over-informative, right? They would constrain the system too much, and we don't, I, I can't, can't even predict what kind of trajectory the system is going to, or this, this Kalman filter is going to estimate, because the ODE and the data may contradict each other, right? But we also have this additional source of uncertainty, this unknown latent force beta. So let's just include that in the state space of this um, dynamical system of this Markov chain. Let's just say that there's also this unknown quantity beta and it, is, it also changes through time according to some stochastic process. We could, for example, again use a Gaussian process, maybe a different one that just tells us something about how the contact rate may change through time. Typically, of course, the contact rate is, will be something that doesn't look like a Gaussian distributed quantity. Um, for example, so contact rates here actually are numbers between zero and one. So we could model that by taking the Gaussian process and mapping it through a nonlinearity like a sigmoid. That's totally straightforward to do because we're already pushing it through a nonlinear uh, equation anyway, through our uh, F, our differential equation. So we'll have to linearize at some point. We'll do that with the extended Kalman filter and then we might as well linearize twice. If we do that, then this ODE filter can estimate both the trajectory of the system and the latent force in a single forward pass. So here's a plot from the corresponding pen paper, which was in New Rips last year, um, where here in black you see again our this data from before, and the red and uh, yellowish, ugly yellowish lines are the um, 
the output of this solver if you run it for a single ODE forward solve. So as the solver runs forward, it observes the trajectory and the fact that this, this, bot, this um, curve here at the bottom is related to the curve at the, plot, uh, at, at the top and um, basically transfers information between the two of them so that early on, we know very little, of course, right? There were basically no cases early on, so how would we know what the contact rate is? There's no information about it. Then as the case numbers rise, the only explanation for why it didn't grow exponentially is that the contact rate had to come down. Then in the first summer in Germany, we had very low uh, case counts, which means that we gain very little information about the, um, the amount of people interacting with each other, because if nobody is infecting each other, we don't know how often people meet. So we become uncertain, then the cases kept rising again, and that provided information about what the contract rate was. And now we can predict into the future without running the solver again. So how expensive is this? Well, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, these probabilistic ODE filters, because they are not super optimized code, they're still something between 10 and 100 times slower than classic ODE solvers. But if you only need to run a solver that's 100 times slower than a classical solver once, rather than a few thousand times, and it's still faster. And in this case, the solution of this kind of problem with this setup, with this particular prior model for the latent force, takes in a programming language like NumPyro something like several hours, and in this setup a few minutes with a probabilistic ODE filter. Not because Bayesian inference is more efficient than uh, point estimation. Of course not, it isn't. Um, and, and not because uncertainty is sort of a magic, a magic tool, but because treating the source of information that is computation and data as a source of information in the same language allows us to do several things within a single for loop that would otherwise require nested loops. But of course, we could also condition various other kind of uh, fun additional information. So for example, this, this dynamical system is maybe not a perfect example of this, but it might be that we have um, some known conservation laws in such systems. So in this case, it would be the number of people, right? You could say, I mean, people either die or they recover, but the total number of the people in the population stays, well, either constant or we know something about how it grows or changes over time. Um, so this is also something that in scientific inference, of course, happens a lot. We often have mechanistic knowledge about Hamiltonians, about conserved quantities you might call energy. And there are classical solvers for these kind of problems. Uh, that, that they are called geometric integrators or symplectic solvers or have various other names that um, um, ensure that certain quantities are conserved in the solution of the ODE. So it turns out that that's just another information operator that we can include in this Kalman filter. So here's an example of a paper that was just, just came out last week at AI Stats by Nathaniel Bosch. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how it works, but if you've seen a, a Kalman filter, an extended Kalman filter with linearization, then you kind of can imagine how it works. You can just condition a system on the fact that some energy is conserved. So here is a uh, henon hylis system. It's basically kind of an orbit in some dynamical system. On the left is the true solution. On, in the middle is a curve that you get if you run a solver at very low precision without conditioning on the fact that energy is conserved. And on the right is the output you get if you run the same solver with the same precision requirements, but conditioned on the conservation of energy. And then, well, I guess you'll hopefully agree with me that that plot is kind of better, closer, a closer approximation to the black one. But the point here is not that this is something you couldn't do before. Of course you could, but that it's a functionality that can be added to one universal, in some sense, kind of algorithm and can be combined in a modular fashion, all in one language, that of Kalman filtering and smoothing, essentially. So, uh, yes. I ask a question. Also, I wanted to, I should have asked at the beginning if you'd rather leave questions to the end or if mm. you want to. Oh, quite. Um, so, if, if you go back to the previous slide, I'm not sure I understand on the top there. So, we have uncertainty about the uh, case counts towards the end. Is any of that uncertainty due to imprecision in the solver, or is that almost all just due to uncertainty? Oh, you mean here on the right? Yeah. Uh, so this is this is me making a big a bad plot. Um, so I, I got the I got the output of the of this curve from from um, Jonathan Schmidt, who was the first author of this paper. And actually, there is a cut here, and this part here is the test set of the problem, which I should have colored in a different different color. Thanks a lot for pointing this out. So basically, where the uncertainty starts rising here is where we switch from train to test. And um, yeah, so th this line kind of lies within the rest. It's also 
clearly a little bit too uncertain, this model, to be honest. Um, so maybe we should have optimized the hyperparameters a little bit more. But yeah, so the sort the reason why the uncertainty here grows is that um, we're not conditioning on this data anymore, actually. Okay, great. So, and so there's not, it, it seems like in the previous model, there was room for there to be uncertainty both due to uh, like not finishing, like solving the ODE and also due to not knowing beta. But here, the uncertainty due to the ODE solve, I think is mostly gone by the time you see this plot. Is that right? It's essentially gone, yeah, because we have so much data that there isn't really much point in, in sort of seeing uncertainty in here in between. So you see a little bit, right? But it's, it's really not that much. So this is, however, of course, we could, so in, in this particular uh, uh, setting, the observation model is very precise because we get relatively precise data from the authorities. Of course, you could have settings where the observed trajectory comes with a lot of noise. It might just be that, you know, you're measuring something with very high uncertainty and then that plot would look differently. We would just have more error bars in the plot. I see. Okay. And I just want to take this. So thank you. I mean, I just want to take this time to encourage anyone in the audience. If you have any conceptual questions, like don't wait till the end of the talk to, uh, you know, ask if, if, you, if the main point is like going over your head. So yes, please do. So in fact, actually, I'm at an intermediate end. So if, if there's lots of questions, I can just stop here. If not, I'm just going to keep, keep uh, going on for a few more minutes. So thanks a lot, uh, Tegan, that you're already raising your hand. Let me just summarize what I just said before, and then that's just going to be two minutes. So my main point is that we, should th we can think about computation as a form of inference, as the collection of information from a computer. And contemporary machine learning requires managing information from different sources of information, from data in an empirical fashion, from a mechanism in the sense of a prior, if you're a Bayesian, and from the computation as, a, as an additional source of information. And probabilistic numerical algorithms allow us to cast the computation part, the third set in this, as in the same mathematical language in probabilistic inference as the other two, um, so to add one more likelihood term to the entire computational pipeline, and that allows us to like, do this whole process a little bit more flexibly. And I've shown you one example of probabilistic ODE solvers, where you can see that these algorithms work as well as the classic methods in the, on, on paper, and they have a, a meaningful uncertainty and can be combined with different sources of mechanistic information, which you could say removes nested loops. You could also say they break the separation between forward and inverse problems. They just make the whole thing as one. Okay, so now, sorry, I like you raised your hand, Tegan. Yeah, no problem. Um, if anybody else has conceptual questions, I'm, I'm also happy to hear those. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I, I was excited to meet you. I read your paper last year. Uh, great, to, great to hear it so far. Um, my question is just a, the basic deep learning person annoying question. Um, have you tried using an RNN instead of a common filter and what happened? Uh, um... So we tried training a, a a node on this once, and it and it, I mean it basically worked, right? So you miss, I mean you you'll end up with something something like this this plot here at the bottom, um, and of course it'll also take longer to train because it'll require multiple ODE solves. So the main the main point of this paper is not that we can do full probabilistic inference in this latent force. You could do that with a Monte Carlo method as well, or with you know some Bayesian deep learning but the fact that we can do it in a single forward pass. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, uh, the main reason I am curious about RNNs is, uh, so I, I do uh, some research in ecology where we have the same kind of um, systems of PDEs, but you sort of know in advance that the PDE is only an approximation for the system that you're looking mm -hmm. at. So you would care a lot about generalization of the system. Like you're not looking for an approximation to a ground truth answer. You're looking for essentially a better model than the PDE of the system. Uh, and ah. you might expect that an RNN would generalize better than a common. Okay, so th this, this is a very good point. Um, if, I, if I can just like, <laughs> allow me to answer in 10 seconds. So I, I would say if, if the, the model mismatch is sort of a, a nuisance, then I would try and model it in the observation likelihood of the Kalman filter and just say, you know, there's, we, we don't quite observe the system correctly. Um, and let's kind of model that, get rid of it. But if, like in your case, it sounds like it's actually a like a core part of the model that you want to really like access and and con like model itself, then 
you could do that in various ways. You could do it with a structured neural network. You could also do it with an additive term in the Gaussian process that like, like, represents this this kind of this kind of structural um, dynamics. Um, but in each case, <laughs> I think it would be possible to to wrap that somehow into the filter um, simply because it's you know it, it, the main point is that the ODE solver itself you can think of as Gaussian inference. And if you know how to do Gaussian inference, whether it be with Bayesian deep learning or with some other uh, um, toolkit, then those two are commensurate with each other. Florian Schurti. I hope uh, I pronounced your name right. Yeah. Uh, hi, Philip. So great talk so far. So I, I'm, I'm wondering about your comment that, um, you know, for the information operators, you, you're using the, uh, you're essentially incorporating them in these Kalman filters as part of the observation likelihood. And I think there are variations of Kalman filters where you can incorporate constraints. You just have to rederive the update equations um, in order to incorporate the Lagrangian. So I, I'm wondering why why proceed with, I guess, soft constraints and not uh, have hard constraints in the Kalman filter if you want to preserve some of so, them. So um, just like you can put constraints in uh, a Gaussian process model or also in deep neural networks through a loss function. You can do that typically in closed form if the constraint is linear and you can't do it in closed form if it's nonlinear. So the information operator we use in ODEs is that the, the, the basic one, the atomic one, is that the derivative of the curve is equal to some nonlinear function evaluated at the curve and that's a nonlinear constraint. So if this were a linear differential equation, you could do it in closed form. But mm -hmm. you can't, can't. So we just have lots and lots and lots of these information operators dotted throughout. And in fact, these solvers adaptively change the step size. So when they think they need a lot of these information, this, this information to like bend the curve very strictly, then they do a lot of ste small steps. And if they think the curve is very smooth, then they take longer steps. Got it. Got it. Great. Thank you. Okay. So now I um, don't like, I, I know that the, the one thing that a speaker is not allowed to do is go over time. So I have a little bit of extra like stuff left that I that I, I can show you and I, I'll try and do it very fast and point out the main thing. So I showed you this slide before, right? So I, I picked out one example now, differential equation solvers. And the one um, thing I don't want you to take away from this is ah. This is all this. This is the special thing about ODE solvers and how somehow we can, you know, do simulation with Kalman filtering. I don't know what what to do with that. I want to find out that this idea that you can think about computation as inference is broader than that, and that in fact, in my opinion, it's actually a very core core to the to like the, the main problems we face in machine learning at the moment. And for that, that what I want to come back to this um, point I made at the beginning that. O almost across the entire field of machine learning by now, people do some form of mini batching, whether they do streaming variational inference or deep learning or whatever you want to call it. We, we tend to estimate some, some uh, unknown quantity theta, let's call them the weight of a neural network or something else or the parameters of your variational bound by minimizing some empirical risk function that might also be a regularized empirical risk function or it might be a log posterior or a log likelihood. And if the model is exchangeable, then you can think of this as a big sum over individual terms. All depend, each term depends on one datum and on all the parameters. And when we face that, then we do subsampling. Of course we do, because we live in the age of big data. So n is a big number, so big that you can't, the, that whenever your, your numerical algorithm, your optimizer, your integrator, whatever you want to call it, asks you to evaluate this thing, you say, nah, I can't, it's too big for my GPU. I'll just use a batch of size, you know, 16 or 32 or whatever and compute this sum. And if I manage to compute, to draw these batch elements IID from the whole data set, then that's sort of a good thing because then this is a Monte Carlo estimator of this. It's unbiased and it's even a sum of IID random variables. So if the batch is large enough, it's going to be a, basically a Gaussian random variable more or less by the central limit theorem that is distributed around the truth. So that sounds good and it is good. It's the reason why a lot of these techniques work well in machine learning, but it also means that our likelihood in the computation. So the term that in a classic classical numerical algorithm would be a Dirac delta, something that encodes the fact that 
the computer computes the thing it's supposed to compute, has now patently become a probability distribution. A Gaussian distribution over the observable, given the underlying thing we actually want to compute, with a variance or a standard deviation that drops like, well, if it's a variance, it drops like one over the batch size, and if it's a standard deviation, it drops over one over the square root of the batch size. And in many parts of, of machine learning, for example, in deep learning, we now um, have, it's completely normal now that this object at the back, the standard deviation, the error bar of the computation, is of comparable size or even larger than the signal we're trying to compute, the value of the gradient, for example, of your deep neural network. And that means that many classical numerical algorithms don't just work all that well in practice anymore, but also that the, the classical way of analyzing them by forward or backward error analysis doesn't really work anymore. So this idea that we can think of our algorithm to, as almost computing the right thing and then being disturbed by a small error just doesn't make sense anymore because the error is actually larger or at least as large as the signal. And in my opinion, this is a large part of why at the moment machine learning still has this um, this, this sort of hacky attitude about it, that we still have to sit in front of our deep learning algorithms and tune learning rates up and down and do things like learning rate decay or find the right batch sizes or choose the right optimizers or stop the algorithm early because it might otherwise overfit because there is information missing in the computation. And so how does this come about? Well, we actually had um, a few papers over the years where I, I tried to argue, not, not like, uh, may, maybe not like conclusively, but I think that there's, a, there's evidence that one of the reasons why contemporary uh, algorithms for machine learning often have free tuning parameters is that the algorithms are only provided with one of those two numbers that define this Gaussian distribution. Or actually, they are not, they are not provided with the information that this computation is stochastic. They are only provided with this thing, with the estimator, which, so it's, that's the batch gradient, for example, uh, or the batch loss, but not the fact that there is a, a variance around them. So um, we recently had a paper that I think was quite contentious, actually. Um, sometimes it's good to have contentious papers in which we wanted to try to point out, it was in ICML this year, um, that this may be a problem. So we did a benchmark of a lot of deep learning optimizers. By now, there's a lot of them. We started the paper with a long list of something like 120 optimizers that were recently published in the last five years or so. Here's the top half of that list. Um, and then we picked the 15 or 14 most popular of those popularity measured in how often they are mentioned in abstracts in, in archive papers, and then ran a benchmark on a bunch of different um, optimization problems. And uh, here you see each vertical bar is one problem, and each of these wiggly lines is one optimizer. And it's a very confusing plot. You're not supposed to see anyone winning because there is no one really winning. There are some optimizers that behave relatively well. Um, they're always kind of good, like Adam, and then there are others that go up and down a little bit. But what actually is hiding in this plot is, one, is, a plot is a part that is in the appendix of this paper, which is if you pick out one of these lines, let's say the one for RMS prop, then you'll actually see that this is the red line here, that it actually made up of an average over many different runs, 10 in this case, of the same optimizer. And the distribution of these 10 runs is actually somewhat comparably wide to the distribution of all the other optimizers in the back. So roughly speaking, if that, that's one of the like, contentious takeaways from this paper, if, you, if you've trained your deep neural network and you don't know how to improve the behavior of your optimizer, just start it again. Because the improvement you're going to get is maybe as good as picking a better optimizer. So this, like, of course, there are now people pointing out that there's probably a, pro that, that, you know, this story is maybe a little bit more complicated than just that. It's also like deliberately a bit of a, bit of a teasing paper. But what I, what for, for me, actually, the message of this paper is that at the moment, as a community, I don't think we really know how to build good optimization methods anymore. And that's weird because in the 80s, we knew how to do that. We had things like BFGS um, that worked quite well and they didn't require any tuning. They were just black boxes. You could just call and they found a minimum. And of course, the reason is partly that things are non-convex anymore and that they, they are very, very high dimensional. As I said at the beginning, we can't even store many gradients anymore. But I think a main part of the problem is massive stochasticity. And stochasticity doesn't have to be bad. We need to embrace it. But we need to deal with the fact that the quantities we compute are patently 
random variables so that there is clearly a likelihood in the computation and that means that we need at least two numbers to describe to our algorithm what it's actually supposed to do. So if you think about why that may be a problem, here's a, here's a simple um, thought experiment. One of the things that, so classic optimization algorithms don't have step sizes. So, you know, BFGS, if you call it, doesn't ask you for a step size, a learning rate. And why? Because it can estimate uh, its step size with a line search. So what it does is it takes a, a, direction, a step in a certain direction, computes a function value and a gradient, takes a step, observes another function value and a gradient, that's four numbers, so you can fit a quadratic polynomial to that and go to the minimum of that. And that's a point estimate for how, how long the step size should be. But if you have an unknown error on each of these numbers, on the gradient and on the function values, now you suddenly need to estimate eight numbers, right? to get, or at least four, right, to get, uh, to, get um, to figure out where your minimum actually is, and that won't work anymore. So if we knew what the variance is, at least the variance, I mean, actually these distributions aren't really Gaussian, they're just approximately Gaussian, but if we knew more about the fact that they are stochastic, then maybe we could do more in terms of optimization. And so we recently like, like we wrote, well, paper, this was actually two years ago, uh, to point out that computing these quantities need not be expensive. So you may think, oh, okay, yeah, if you do full Bayesian inference, then everything is tractable, fine, but full Bayesian inference is expensive. Well, it turns out, if you think about it, maybe it's not so expensive, really. So I mentioned this problem before, right, that we're, what we're doing is we're doing mini-batching to compute loss functions. Of course, we use autodiff, typically, so we compute gradients, and gradients you can basically move because they're linear through these sums. So what tools like JAX uh, and, and Torch and TensorFlow and so on do is that they automate this process of computing this quantity. And inside, they actually compute a matrix, essentially. So a gradient for every element in the batch, for every datum, one gradient, and then they sum over one of the dimensions of that matrix to provide this estimator. So this, this is literally this sum, right, to get, give a batch gradient estimate. Now, let's say we wanted to estimate just an element-wise error bar on each of these quantities. So we've just wanted to know what their variance is. Then a, a simple way to compute an empirical estimate of this variance, admittedly, it's going to be biased if we do both at the same time, but let's forget about that. Then we could just take each element in that sum and square it. And that will give us an estimate of the second moment of this random variable. So how expensive is that going to be? Well, we've already computed this. This is the magic backprop that so much of machine learning is about. So that's what the GPU helps us to do. So we have all those numbers in the GPU. And now the only thing we have to do is to collapse through that sum again, uh, sorry, element-wise square those numbers. And that's cheap to do and sum again. So it turns out that it's possible to do that. You can even add hooks to, back, uh, to, to, uh, to PyTorch to do that. So here is, okay, fancy picture I'm not gonna talk about. Um, from a, from a tool called Backpack for PyTorch, which you can simply install, and it allows computing all sorts of interesting quantities, including, for example, also curvature, um, um, using quantica factor approximations, like the k-fact that uh, Roger Gross has helped um, um, bring into the world. I think he was here in the call a while ago, maybe he's left by now. Um, very cheaply, with minimal overhead, if um, you ele compute them um, element-wise. So, so far, my group has not, and this is my final slide I'm going to show you, has not really figured out how to use all of these quantities to build better optimizers. Um, the only thing we have like, begun to do is to just look at them and enjoy how uh, colorful they are. So we had a paper at NeurIPS last year with a tool called Cockpit, and which we basically just provide a view on a lot of these quantities to just allow people, now that we can actually compute them, to look at them while, an, while a neural network is training. And if I had more time, I could tell you about all of these different quantities. But if you're excited by colorful pictures and want to stare at what's going on with your, with your neural network, please try and uh, play around with Cockpit. So with that, I want to um, thank my wonderful uh, research group. Um, a lot of the papers that I've just shown you are um, developed by uh, these people here in this picture, different PhD students. So the security has just switched off the light in my lab, I'm sorry. And I'm at the end, so um, <laughs> that was a clear signal. Thank you very much for your attention. I want to point out that computation is an instance of inference, and that allows us to build numerical algorithms which take advantage of this, either to do faster computation or to create new functionality 
that isn't directly available in cl classic algorithms. And if you take one thing away from this talk, I hope that you start, like, whenever you see a black box in your code, something that someone tells you was invented by applied mathematicians and you are not allowed to change it, then that's usually the point to look. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Phil. So this is a very thought-provoking talk. So I expect there'll be at least like 10 or 15 minutes of questions. So I suggest we, you know, <laughs> let those who want to leave and let, let them leave. And uh, if, you're, if you're willing to stick around for like 10 or 15 minutes, I think. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Then. And thanks thanks a lot for your patience. <laughs> oh, sure. And also I wanted, so I asked the audience for questions and we got some experts who weighed in with uh, tricky questions, but I also want to, Encourage anyone who just came and has not is not familiar with this area. Please ask your very basic questions. Like, I don't know. At the end of these talks, someone always comes and says, "But does this work in more than one dimension or something?" Right? And I was like, "No." Yes, you guys also please ask your questions. All right. Um, I'll let you, Phil. I'll let you uh, choose the uh, question. Ah, so uh, Florian has raised his hand again. So I'm definitely yeah. Uh, I'll wait if anyone else wants to raise their hand, but please go ahead. Great. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm wondering uh, there. Uh, I'm wondering about the relationship of uh, this um, work in the future with uh, what um, uh, what MTS Khan uh, is calling the Bayesian duality and trying to get, uh, you know, uh, trying to connect this to uh, maximum entropy principle and trying to get distributions over optimizers. Um, so what are some of the theoretical relationships uh, between the two? So um, I'm... Uh... I want to be very cautious of this because I don't want to misrepresent MT's uh, uh, work. He, he, he also recently gave a talk in my group and I um, I think, of course, I have a very like biased view of it because I look at it from my with my sort of uh, mm -hmm. goggles on, right? Um, but I, my, my understanding, the, the Bayesian learning rule is about interpreting um, loss functions and how we step in them, when, how optimizers step in them as a, um, a form of Bayesian inference. And for that, the shape of the loss function is, a part, is of particular importance. So it's like the, the shape of the loss function enters directly as a, as for the motivation of the, the way that the algorithm works. And then that provides, in some sense, motivation to use some optimizers over others for particular loss functions. Um, in, in our work, we tend to think of the, the quantity that is being computed as just a function over which you put a prior um, and then you can use different optimizers and apply them to the same functions over which you have priors and then sometimes it turns out that some aspects of the prior change the behavior of the optimizer so for example all of quasi newton methods are can be thought of as also filters that do gaussian inference and um, i think with david we discussed this a long time ago as well and they have different gains. So they're basically different models for how quickly this, the, the Hessian changes as you move. But this is, is more on a, this, these are kind of parametric assumptions about, about the, 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 this unknown quantity that we're trying to model called a function. And in the Bayesian learning rule, that, that, that function itself has a more prominent role. So they are, they are related. I still, we are still figuring out how they are related. I wouldn't say, they're certainly not the same, um, mm -hmm. but um, there's, I think a different focus on what you want to call and like part of the assumption and motivation for the model. Got it. Thank you. Okay, um, Aravind. Um, hi, Professor. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the amazing lecture. I just had one quick question. So during the initial part of the lecture, when you talked about overcoming nested loops, I just I was just wondering whether you're worried about, um, and you introduced a new likelihood operator. So have you thought about um, uh, uh, how introducing, how the fact that if we introduce a large number of evaluations of this likelihood operator or the information operator, whether this might over overwhelm the initial observation that we started with and we did not generate? Um, so in, in this very specific setting, let me just go to the corresponding slide. In this very specific setting that um, I showed, this is not going to be a problem because this initial observation is of basically a different type, right? So the initial observation clamps down the first state and all the subsequent observations clamp down subsequent states. And for like, it's, it's abs absolutely not obvious, but in these particular stochastic differential equations we use to model these ODEs, 
those two are orthogonal to each other. So one does not blot out the other. And that's actually one of the reasons, one of the motivations for the particular stochastic process we use, this Wiener, integrated Wiener process, rather than a stationary Gaussian process, for example. But you're actually raising, I think, maybe a, there's an interesting other point underneath, which is that we are, if we want to ensure that we have um, linear cost in the algorithm, which I think we, we, we need, um, because otherwise we can't compete with classic numerical methods, then we have to use a Kalman filter. And Kalman filters have this chain structure that I show here, which, I mean, if you've seen graphical models before, then you know that what this model means is that every single Z in this, in this graph is independent of the other ones when conditioned on the Markov chain above. So they are conditionally independent given the latent states. And there are settings in which this isn't true. So, in fact, I uh, maybe showed you one, right? So in this, in this domain, there is this latent quantity which um, may not... Uh, actually, here it works, because if you condition on the latent quantity, then it's exactly true. But we're using a linearization, the extended Kalman filter, that makes it ever so slightly not true anymore. And you could have extreme cases where this latent state doesn't change through time, but ha enters through a strong nonlinearity. And then this assumption that these states are independent observations is just patently not true anymore. So then, I mean, fundamentally, the right way to fix that would be to use a Gaussian process rather than a Gauss-Markov process, but that's going to be too expensive, so we can't do that. And then we have to enter all sorts of approximate tricks. And the most extreme version of that would be to go back basically to have two loops again. Um, so I'm not, yeah, I, I shouldn't say more about this. If you want to read up on it, actually, I can show you in my backup somewhere, there's a paper recently called Fenrir, which you can find on the archive. Um, it's not published yet, uh, where we discuss this issue a little bit more. But maybe the, the big overarching message is um, just like we have to be careful about factorization assumptions we make in, in data-driven inference in machine learning, we have to be careful about them in numerical computation as well. And they can cause overconfidence, for example. Okay. So, yeah, very good point. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Hi, sorry, I had a quick yes. question. Thanks for a great talk, by the way. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering, so when you were talking about like the Hamiltonian uh, example, you had the... Mm -hmm. Uh, integrator and you, you said you condition on energy being conserved. I was just curious what that would look like. Like, is it like a simplex? Ah, so very um, simply, um, do we have this here somewhere? Ah, it's not a, okay, it's not a particularly good example. So, so, so what is Hamiltonian? It's a function of the state. So there's all these y's that are, you know, the, 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 the curve and various derivatives of it. And then there's a function of it called the Hamiltonian, which has the property that it doesn't change through time. So what we do is we compute this function, which is a nonlinear function of the states, compute its derivative through time, which is a linear operation on that function, and then condition the extended Kalman filter on the fact that that number, this time derivative of this nonlinear function is zero. And that is, so, I mean, we think of physical systems when we talk about energy being conserved, but this is a relatively generic concept. So you can apply this also to other quantities being conserved, like, for example, the number of people in this SIR model. Um, right. But I guess my question is like when you, so when you solve this numerically, I mean, you have this, this filtering method. So the, the integrator itself doesn't need to conserve the energy. It's this extra. Yes. So that, actually, in fact, uh, it typically okay. doesn't, which is what you see in the middle, in the middle plot. So these, these uh, stochastic differential equations, because they are just, so, I mean, so a Wiener process on a bunch of states doesn't conserve any energy because the states just behave, you know, like a random walk. And um, uh, there's no relationship between them being encoded. So if, if you want that, that certain quantities to be conserved, then you have to basically tell the solver explicitly about it. And this is also how classic geometric integrators work. You provide them with the Hamiltonian that has to be conserved, and then they, through various like local numerical tricks ensure that that quantity is conserved by projecting onto some other representation and ensuring that there's no change in that representation. Okay, thanks. I think that makes some sense to me. I'll probably go look at the paper though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please do. Thanks a lot.
I just want to chime in with, there was one magical part to all of this that I wasn't clear when I started reading Phil's stuff, which is that because everything is jointly linear Gaussian, conditioning is an exact operation, like at least sort of locally. So the fact that this derivative is zero cashes out in just a bunch of more matrix multipliers for your means and very predictive means and variances. Yes. I, I remember that, you know, David, when you and you and I were PhD students, I, I, I at least at some point was was totally enthralled by the fact that you can condition a Gaussian process on gradient observations. That seemed absolutely magical back then. I think by now it's, it has become a sort of a, a thing we, we, we mentioned in undergraduate lectures because it's kind of a, a, a neat little twist. Um, but this is the, the, a fundamental aspect of all of these tools that we, we try to describe the computation largely in terms of Gaussian descriptions, right? So we used Gaussians as a tool for un to represent uncertainty because Gaussian inference is maps or Gaussians map probabilistic inference onto linear algebra and linear algebra is the thing that computers are very good at. So we can then produce all of this functionality using efficient code. All right. So it sounds, it sounds like I've exhausted the patience of the audience. Um, thank you very much for, for all of your questions. That was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for, uh, your, for giving this talk. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks.